Thanks for coming to join us. My name is Mona Dreiser. I'm the Deputy Director of the Center for Global Security Research. And this morning, I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Corey Shockey, um, who will talk to us about her new book called Safe Passage, presenting her research on the transition of hegemonic power from the United Kingdom to the United States. I think it was published by Harvard University Press late last year, so check it out, um, and uh, particularly if you're interested after this talk. Uh, Corey is a distinguished uh, research fellow at the Hoover Institute, institution at uh, Stanford University, and she teaches on thinking about war. And we're really lucky she agreed to come and visit and talk to us today. She's within about two weeks moving to London, where she'll take up the position of Deputy Director General of the Inst International Institute for Strategic Studies in London. Um, she's a leading defense expert and during her career has held policy positions across the government, academia, and think tanks, including working with both military and civilian staffs at the Pentagon, the White House on the National Security Council, and the U.S. Department of State as the deputy head of strategic, uh, head of policy planning. Um, she served as a senior policy advisor to Senator John McCain when he ran for president. And her academic career includes appointments at the U.S. Military Academy, Johns Hopkins University, University of Maryland, teaching strategy war and European security. She has a lot of publications. I'm not going to run through them. No, come on up. Run through them all now. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Corey Shockey. Thanks. It is such a pleasure to be here at the lab, most especially because when I was a fledgling PhD student, this institution um, bankrolled my research and uh, kept me afloat. I was ABD for six years, uh, so, so please don't let any of your students ever do that. But I was working in the Pentagon the whole six years. And um, I got a pre-doc from the lab that gave me the start of uh, the research time under Mike May and Paul Brown to do my dissertation research. So I'm super grateful for the generosity of a place that believed in me when I was just starting out. Um, and it makes me joyful to be back among you. The book I'm gonna talk about today is one I got started writing the idea had been jangling around for me for a long time, that with all the talk about the rise of China and what it would mean for the United States and whether it could happen peacefully, I was curious as a, as a political scientist about what makes for peaceful transitions. And I started thinking about it, didn't know a bunch about the subject, got distracted for some time because uh, Jim Mattis and I did a big study of civil military relations and that took me off track for a couple of years. When I finally went back, and the whole time that I wasn't working on this question, I kept anxiously watching to see whether somebody smarter than me had already written this book in the meantime while I was not doing it and was super relieved that nobody beat me to it. I didn't know when I started writing the book that there is in fact only one peaceful transition between a dominant power in the international order and a rising challenger. Um, and that transition is between Britain as the rule setter and enforcer of the international order in the 19th century and the United States, which, which begins its rise. I clocked the start of the rise at 1823 and I end the book in 1945. Uh, those were not the original dates I started on um, clocking this with. I wanted to start with uh, the election of Andrew Jackson, right? Because what the, Brit the way the British thought about themselves in the early 19th century was as a liberal state that wasn't democratic. right? That they had free market policies, that they believed in in uh, represent, they believed in constitutional restraints on a monarch, so that distinguished them, made them more politically liberal than the continental powers in Europe. Um, and the United States, in all of our rambunctiousness and risk tolerance, like Andrew Jackson exemplifies that. 
right? He's this raw-hewn frontiersman. Uh, a British newspaper described the United States as a country run by demagogues and non-entities. Right? People who were unqualified for the responsibilities of governing others. Um, my favorite description of the United States of Americans at that time comes from the British historian Bertha Ann Reuter, who said, Americans are a people too extreme in politics or religion or both to live in peace where they came from. And that is actually what we look like to the British. It's very easy. Uh, so, so I should say, I'm poorly trained in several disciplines, right? As a, I'm, my graduate work is in government. It was supervised by an economist, and I mostly write history. Uh, and one of the things I notice is that people who are not historians very often project back into the past this mythologically wonderful time, right? There was a time when NATO allies weren't tiresome and difficult to get along with, and everybody understood the program and supported the United. I'm a NATO historian. I don't remember that time, and it certainly wasn't any time between 1949 and the present. And we find the same thing with uh, thinking about Anglo-America, as it came to be called at the end of the 19th century. People now project back that because we speak a similar language, because we both have politics that come out of the European Enlightenment, because of racial similarities, r religious similarities, that we're alike. That is not what Britain and the United States looked like at the start of this process. It's something that we, it's a fiction we create in the 1870s and 1880s about each other. At the start of this process, the United States looked like what Britain feared itself becoming, right? Where anybody could dictate what the government did. And you didn't have to be a landowner. You didn't have to be an aristocrat. You didn't have to be somebody vetted by the existing powers to be able to have influence. Um, moreover, the United States, as a political culture, defined ourselves in opposition to Britain, right, from the very start. So the way that I uh, start telling the story is I picked nine inflection points across the hundred years or so in which the transition occurs. And the way that I chose them wasn't just that they were conflicts, that there was potential for war. I chose the nine points in time where the United States tries to change the rules, right? Because what a hegemon is, is the rule setter and the rule enforcer of the international order. A hegemon isn't always the richest country. It isn't always the strongest country. It is one that is willing and able to set and enforce the rules in the international order. And that was Britain in the 19th century. They come out of the Napoleonic Wars as the country with the ability, in large part not because of their power, because of their finesse, their ability to aggregate a group of countries together for common purpose for a limited period of time when they needed to round up a posse and set and enforce rules. So one of the interesting things about British dominance of the international order is that they never wear it comfortably in the way that the United States wears it arrogantly and comfortably, right? Because all of Britain's great successes result from coalition victories. Think about Wellington at Waterloo, right? The British, the victory over Napoleon fundamentally depends on the arrival of Blucher's cavalry from the Prussian direction. The United States, on the other hand, we, we're broader shouldered than that. Uh, and so, so they look very different to each other. But the commonality the two have is in their time of dominance, they set the rules of order and they enforce the rules of order. So I start with the Monroe Doctrine, which um, many of you may already know, was actually a British proposal to the United States. They proposed that we and they together prevent continental Europeans from establishing colonies in the Americas. 
It happens at the time when the Spanish and Portuguese empires are corroding, right? So you begin to get independence movements in Spain and Portugal's colonies. And the reason Britain and the United States cared about it, uh, you know, we ennoble it with our political, uh, with our politics, but in fact, the motivation at the time for both Britain and the United States was that the continental Europeans had a closed trading system. You could not trade with their colonies, it was all internal trade. And Britain and the United States, as the early industrializers, were interested in an open trading regime because that benefited their advantages in trade. So the British proposed this to us. And the reason the British don't just do it themselves, anybody know how many ships the United States had uh, in the Caribbean Navy at this time? Okay. In 1898, we had six, right? So this is 1823. The Caribbean flotilla of the American Navy is nothing. And the, the joke about uh, the Monroe Doctrine is that we declare that the Americas are no longer situated for colonization by any European power. The British Navy, the Royal Navy, actually enforces this for the next 70 years before the United States has the naval power to enforce it ourselves. So what happens during the Monroe Doctrine is it gets started, it actually, like so much that's great about these United States, the Monroe Doctrine actually has its origins here in California. Because a few years earlier, uh, I think it's 1821, uh, the Russian Tsar declares an a economic exclusion zone around all of Russia's territories, including Sitka in Alaska and Bodega Bay. Um, and Alta California, as it was then called, as a Mexican territory, uh, you have Americans already streaming west, and if Russia has exclusive economic control of those areas, the United States worried about its ability to have uh, ports on the west coast of the American continent. Uh, so John Quincy Adams, the Secretary of State, writes back this uh, you know, typically American arrogant response that these colonies are no longer suitable for European colonization and we won't stand for this by the Russians. Almost the exact same language he uses three years later in, in the establishment of the Monroe Doctrine. The British uh, tried to reject this unilateral stipulation of a new kind of international law. That's the new rules we are setting. We say no country, no European country has a right to colonization on the American continent. Um, and everybody else says, watch us, right? Nobody cares, but the British are strong enough to still enforce what they want, which is an open trading regime. So that's the first example. Unlike the Revolutionary War or the War of 1812, which are both instances where what the United States tries to get is the, exact, the enforcement of rules Britain has already established, right? What do the rebellious colonies want? They want the rights of Englishmen, and that's what Britain denies them. In 1812, we want an end to the impressment of sailors on the high sea. Again, we want Britain to enforce the rules they've established. What begins happening in 1823 is we start being a law unto ourselves. And that's what the British are afraid of. And the moral of the story in the book is that uh, a hegemonic power tends to recreate the international order as a macrocosm of its own image. So if you want to see what a Chinese-dominated international order would look like, the best indicator you can have is to look at the domestic order of power in China because that's what hegemons do. They recreate the order into uh, what looks comfortable to them and what looks comfortable to them is their domestic political order. So the second uh, inflection point, the second case in the book, is uh, the Oregon boundary crisis. 
1850, excuse me, 1845. So James K. Polk gets elected president uh, on, a, on a platform of throwing off Mexico's control over what is now the southern and western United States and throwing off British control over what is now the Northwest United States. Uh, starting in 1819, Britain and the United States had joint sovereignty over what was then called the Oregon Territory. Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Wyoming, that swath. We and the British had agreed by treaty that we would both jointly exercise the sovereignty of a state. And that worked really well because nobody lived there, right? <laughs> um, the British Hudson Bay Company did its trapping there. And the United States uh, had, I think it was about 50 settlers living there. But then the Oregon Trail opens up and Americans start streaming westward. Gold gets discovered in California, silver in Nevada. Americans are moving westward in enormous numbers. And the claim that the Polk administration makes against Mexico is that the government of Mexico lacked the ability to protect uh, settlers from Indian raids. The claim that Polk makes in the North is that Britain not being a democracy, it has no right to represent the settlers living in the Oregon Territory. So again, it's the assertion of a new rule, which is that only representative governments have, the right, have rights under international law. <coughs> and the British are having none of this from us, right? The British government waits until the United States is already fighting Mexico, uh, but they don't wait long enough that we win. So they impose on, uh, they start flowing a fleet to the Caribbean. They start moving forces through Canada to the west in order to fight for their sovereignty in Oregon. And <clears throat> the Polk administration, President Polk himself, expresses his surprise that the British are not so pacific as they are purported to be, he says. Um, but what the British force on Polk is what the United States was able to force on Britain in the War of 1812, which is fighting a two-front war on widely unconnected fronts so you couldn't flow forces. And, and Polk understands the United States can't win that war and so compromises. And that's how you get a straight border that goes out from all the way across the northern part of the United States. What is mysterious for the British about the Oregon boundary crisis is why the United States doesn't just wait and let demography solve this problem, right? Because American settlers were flowing in such large numbers into the region that we would very quickly have had de facto control. And the reason Polk didn't just wait and let demography take its course is because rising powers tend to be you know, aggressive, militaristic, nouveau riche, and demanding. That is, they're an awful lot like America generally. Um, and, and so one other thing to consider about managing rising powers is that the United States tends to be pretty good at it, which goes to, to the concluding comments about China. So that's the Oregon Boundary Crisis. The third case I look at is why does the British government not recognize the Confederacy during the American Civil War? If there was ever an opportunity to prevent a rising power from consolidating its strength, that was it, right? The British wouldn't have even had to intervene. Simply recognizing the Confederacy would have been sufficient to cause Britain and other countries not to honor the blockade of southern ports, to open up enterprise between the Confederacy and British ports. Lots of good reasons the British should have done it. Economic compatibility, the British aristocracy feels a sense of commonality. I look at the period before 1863, before the fall of 1863, that is, before the Emancipation Proclamation. Because once you have 
Lincoln really committing the North to the cause of abolition, it becomes socially impossible for Britain, which had outlawed slavery in 1823, to side with the Confederacy. But up until 1863, you know, Lincoln is still saying, this is a war about Southern succession. This is, this has, we will permit the continuation of human chattel slavery, provided that the Union remains whole. Um, and so uh, it's not until the embrace of abolition that Britain doesn't feel like it has room to, to uh, recognize the Confederacy. This is my favorite chapter in the book because what comes through in Palmerston's consideration on three different, at three different occasions before 1863, the British government very seriously considers recognizing the Confederacy. And they choose not to. And the reasons they choose not to, one of them is strategic, which is Britain controlled the international order because it controlled the only reliable means of transportation, which is shipping. And the Royal Navy, as the key to that control, used blockades frequently in order to impose the rules. And Britain, betting that the United States was going to continue to grow more powerful, wanted to get rules in place before the United States was a, a hugely dominant power. Rules that could constrain us by terms that were still advantageous to Britain. So they made a vote about enforcing the rules. But the main reasons the Palmerston government doesn't uh, recognize the Confederacy are really touching about who we are as a political culture. And it's both the breadth of political participation for its time, the breadth of political participation in the United States. The, the Palmerston government was at that time trying to beat back efforts to expand the franchise in Britain. And they believed that if they recognized the Confederacy, it would be more difficult to prevent liberalization politically in Britain. That is, that if they associated themselves with the reactionaries in the American South, that it would increase pressure within Britain for changing the political system. The second reason, even sweeter, is that who we are as an immigrant culture um, sh prevented the strongest power in the international order from using its foreign policy tools. By 1860, the overwhelming majority of immigrants from Britain to the United States were from Ireland and Scotland to the industrial north. And the British government feared that if it associated itself with the Confederacy, the familial links between Irish in America and Irish in Ireland, between Scots in America and Scots in Scotland, would make it harder for Britain to control those two uh, constituent parts of Great Britain. That is, we tend to think of our immigrant composition as a risk in warfare, right? Think about the disgraceful um, uh, internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. We think about it as a vulnerability. In the most important case uh, of of Americans in warfare, who we are as an immigrant community was a strength. It was a tool we were able to use against a stronger power than us because the British were really fearful about Irish Americans and Scottish Americans and even English Americans from big cities like Manchester, which had no political representation in Parliament, that those people would become an internal force undercutting the government. The next case I look at after the Civil War isn't one, it's not an instance, it's not a moment, but I look at the way in the 1870s that both Britain and the United States in that decade choose their kind of defining myth of the culture. For the United States, it's the westward expansion, right? It's the myth of individuality and individual conquering nature and hard fought gains against worthy adversaries. Uh, and for Britain, it is about 
peaceful change, right? That they're not the French Revolution, that they managed to absorb the enormous change that the Industrial Revolution and expanding the franchise in Britain and kind of the social consolidation of all of those things. They do that peacefully. What happens as the two countries uh, have these consuming internal discussions is that they begin to look similar to each other and different from everybody else. So the US, because of our westward expansion, comes to think of ourselves in imperial terms, right? And Britain becomes a democracy. And we have that in co those things in common with each other and not in common with anyone else. And that's when this sense of sameness starts, right? You see it in the religious revivalism in the United States. You see it, the most fun research I did for the book was reading British travel writers uh, across the 1860s, 70s, and 80s, right? If you, at the start of that period, Charles Dickens comes on a tour of the United States and he describes the United States as more barbarian than the Indian cultures it displaces on the continent. Right? Uh, a, a British travel writer says that uh, coming to the United States in the late 1860s, that he is convinced of two things. That first, fundamentally, the United States is the future. And second, it is irretrievably barbarian, <laughs> right? Uh, by the late 1870s, you have this, the notion of Anglo-America, right? That we're fundamentally alike each other and different from everybody else. You start to have marriages right? Rich American daughters of industrial champions start marrying into the British aristocracy. You have enormous swaths of British investment into the post-Civil War United States, the railroads and all of, and you begin to have cross-cutting investment by Americans into Britain. So you see the starting of them knitting together. The moment at which it becomes manifest is the next uh, case study in the book. It's an obscure little crisis, completely unimportant, which is the closest we come to war with Great Britain across this 100-year period. It's the 1895 Venezuelan debt crisis, right? Um, it's the first time the United States enforces the Monroe Doctrine. And that, and that doctrine gets enforced by a, a Democratic president Grover Cleveland, who was so opposed to American imperialism that he refused to proceed with the annexation of Hawaii. It was already in train, the, the documentation was before the Congress. He withdrew it because he felt it was imposing uh, on, against the will of the people of Hawaii to make them Americans, right? So not a natural Monroe Doctrine guy. And here's what happens. Uh, it's such a delightful American story that this gets the, the Caudillo governing Venezuela defaults on his debts, right? The British and Germans and Italians had a whole bunch of money invested there building railroads and infrastructure and stuff like that. And as was typical among Latin American uh, governance at the time, the government gets overthrown by another strong man. He defaults on the debt saying, I didn't personally benefit from this. You guys can take it up with the guy who's in prison now. Um, and the British and the Germans with you know, an Italian tagging along afterwards show up at the port of Corinto, land marines, uh, and start taking customs duties. Uh, the American Secretary of State only, right, totally unexpectedly, writes a 12,000 word diplomatic note to the British objecting to them doing this, saying it's a violation of the Monroe Doctrine, and ending with this stem winder. American law is fiat upon this continent, right? Uh, the British get it. Uh, and the Salisbury government uh, gives a two-sentence reply, which is, 
uh, Her Majesty's government controls more territory on the American continent than the United States do, full stop. Uh, and that's what, that indignity is what makes Grover Cleveland decide that he needs to enforce the Monroe Doctrine. Because after all, you know, the United States is a rising power and, and won't be treated this way. So somebody who had started off his presidential term arguing that the Monroe Doctrine was troublesome and he would like to avoid it as long as he could, finds himself willing to go to war with the dominant power in the international order to defend it over Venezuela. Oh, I'm sorry, I left out one delicious uh, element of the Venezuela crisis, which is the Caudillo governing Venezuela gets the idea to go to the Monroe Doctrine because a paid American lobbyist working for him suggests it. <laughs> 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 so Cleveland goes to the Congress and gets a unanimous support in both houses of Congress for going to war with Great Britain over Venezuela, a war we would have lost, right? There's actually no doubt we would have lost this war. And what it would have resulted in was, you know, us losing in the Caribbean, probably uh, Americans not entirely under government control, the Irish Finians and such, uh, trying to take Canada, Britain bombarding the ports of New York and Philadelphia and Washington, like very messy, very fast. Um, and yet Cleveland gets a unanimous support in the Congress. So to the closing moments of managing a rising China, how much nationalism and a sense of being treated disrespectfully matters to rising powers. At the start of the crisis, I, I told you Salisbury's response. Six months later, and, uh, the British fold, and Salisbury is cheered in Parliament for saying there is no greater supporter of the Monroe Doctrine than Her Majesty's government. What happens in between? What happens is actually this sense of sameness between Americans and Britain creates this civic connection, creates the space for political compromise by governments. What happens in between is American newspapers put out uh, a call for uh, letters of solidarity between Britain among you know, Americans and the British, and they get an avalanche of responses, including from the Prince of Wales, the husband of Queen Victoria, arguing that war between our two countries would be fratricide. 354 members of the British Parliament write an open letter to their American congressional counterparts urging that any conflict between the two societies be resolved by arbitration always into the future. The J. Ponsfold Arbitration Treaty comes out of the, the Venezuelan debt crisis. You get a sense of, again, this happens in societies that are already democracies that view themselves as similar. You get the space for policy compromise even when governments are pushing towards conflict. That's what happens in the Venezuelan debt crisis. From that point in time, 1895, Britain and the United States are considered to be allies by their adversaries, even though it's still fraught for some time, right? Uh, the J. Ponsfote Arbitration Treaty fails, to be, fails ratification in Congress. Um, so, so Americans are still slow to warm to this notion, but, but um, it's in place. The next case study in the VIC is the 1898 Spanish-American War. Uh, Commodore Dewey, uh, who fought the Battle of Manila Bay, argues that his success was materially reliant on British assistance. So Britain was neutral in the war between Spain and the United States, but they assisted us in all sorts of ways that were recognized by everybody else uh, 
engaged in this. So um, Britain, for example, allows American forces to use the uh, Trans-Pacific Telegraph Cable, which Britain had the only one and controlled it. It allowed refueling of coal stops for American ships at British ports. It denied it to the Spanish, even as far away as Egypt. Uh, when, so, so in the Spanish-American War, like the American Civil War, all the attention gets focused on the Eastern theater, right? Uh, Teddy Roosevelt and his Rough Riders, San Juan Hill. Strategically, as with the American Civil War, it's the Western theater that's much more important. It's the battle for the Philippines and control in the Pacific. And there, the Royal Navy was flat out assisting American war efforts. There's a moment in the battle for Manila Bay where Dewey is about to fire on, so, so Dewey sinks the Spanish fleet in about four hours and is about to move on Manila and the Germans sail their fleet. The German Kaiser, quite aggressive at this time, uh, wants to make a play for control of Manila themselves. They sail their fleet into protection of Manila. And the Royal Navy captain in command of the British flotilla, Chichester, sails the British fleet into American lines. So Spain can't, excuse me, so Germany cannot get engaged without going to war with Britain at the same time dramatically raising the stakes. Uh, so by 1898, other people think about Britain and the United States as allied, even though we are not formally. The next case is World War I. And what's interesting about World War I is that by then, you have this, you know, this golden age sense of Britain and the United States, a special relationship. We're assisting each other so much. But in fact, the United States begins to feel its power as a hegemon by then, right? By the end of World War I, the US is flowing 10,000 soldiers a day into the European fight. Britain only succeeds in breaking the, the stalemate on the Western Front because of American money, American trade, and American soldiers. And that, that shift in dependence from us being reliant on them for help to them being reliant for us on help is you can see the shift beginning to manifest itself there. And the British are desperately nervous that we are actually going to use that leverage to their detriment. They do an internal study in 1916 to figure out whether the United States could force Britain to lose the war. They're very nervous about the way Woodrow Wilson is equivocating between what the British are trying to achieve and the Germans. Because these guys all look, it looks like a big costly mess to the United States. So what begins to happen in 1914 is the United States begins to impose our values on the relationship. Think Wilson's 14 points, right? Think what we try to do at Versailles which is support self-determination, to support free trade. That is to break Britain's hold of preferential trade internal to their colonies, which is their strategy for reconstituting their wealth and their power after World War I. At the end of World War I, the relationship is still emotional enough that we let a different set of rules apply to Britain than we apply to France or Italy or Germany or Japan. By 1923, we no longer are willing to give Britain different rules. That's the next case in the book. It's the Washington Naval Accords, where the United States comes up with this big grand notion of how we're going to prevent military competition in Asia. And we convene, the Harding administration convenes a naval conference in Washington and actually succeeds at doing what Woodrow Wilson failed at doing in uh, the Versailles aftermath, which is imposing an American set of rules on the existing order, right? We, it's a series of six interconnected treaties about China, Japan, Asia, sets fleet limits for all of the countries, 
And Britain argues that they have a three ocean navy because of their colonies and therefore deserve wider latitude, a larger navy than the United States has. And we refuse. In fact, we give, opt, we give special clauses to the French, the Italians, and the Japanese, and we give no special quarter to the British. So that's the moment when Britain realizes that the United States is not only going to create a different kind of international order, it's going to impose it on Britain. The last chapter in the book is World War II, which is where you see these trends writ large in technicolor across a drive-in movie screen. Uh, for all of you youngsters, a drive-in movie screen is something that back <laughs> in the day did what, what your computer does now. Um, <laughs> uh, and so what you see happen is a United States, so again, the mythology of the special relationship of Churchill and FDR. In fact, what you see is Churchill desperate for bringing American power to bear on Britain's side of the line and the U.S. only agreeing to if Britain agrees to an open trading order, to self-determination, to American values being taken as universal values. That's the Atlantic Charter that they sign um, in 1940, I think it is. You see a real tension between the military staffs of Britain and the United States over where the war effort is going to go with the American Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Secretary of Defense arguing as late as the summer of 1943 for a Pacific First strategy. And real anxiety that the British are, as they did in World War I, dragging American strength in to uphold Britain's colonies. So that's how the Mediterranean strategy is viewed internal to the administration. That it, both uh, MacArthur and Admiral King get offered British forces and refuse them because they do not want the war in the Pacific tainted by Britain's colonial relationships. Um, and what you see in the European theater is Britain, uh, so you take the Hopkins visit, right? Uh, FDR's emissary, which Churchill touts as proof that the United States and Britain are uniquely linked together. Hopkins makes the same trip to Moscow a couple of months later, and he gets sent by FDR for the exact same reason, which is to determine whether these two countries are strong enough and brave enough to continue fighting the Nazis because Roosevelt concluded that if either Britain or Russia folded, there was no combination of, of other actors that could defeat the Nazis, including with American participation. So that's, that's where they sit. Lend-lease goes predominantly to Russia and China, not to Britain, right? So, so tearing away the mythology to see how much this was a practical strategic set of judgments and not an, an affectionate one is where the book ends. And then I talk in the closing chapter about how uh, a rising America grows less and less tolerant of the British. The British are an amazing hegemon because of their patience and, and forbearance in dealing with an upstart America. What is different about the international order that the United States created after 1945, though, and what has made it so much more resilient and enduring than other hegemonic orders is the liberal rules that we created, that is, the extrapolation into the international order of, our, of the microcosm of our domestic political order, that is, we bound our power by institutions and by rules, mostly even followed them, that gave lesser powers a vote over how we behaved in the international order, that got others to contribute to the upholding of the international order. Um, 
So if you think about President Trump's complaint about freeloading American allies, certainly true, it's always been true. What is different from previous international orders is that they are voluntarily helping to uphold it. So you shouldn't think, wow, they're not doing as much as we want them to do. The proper way in a historical context to look at post-1945 American dominated international order is you should marvel at the extent to which others have wanted us to succeed at this and have contributed to the success of this. It is largely attributable to the genius of George Marshall and Harry Truman and company to build a or an order that others also benefited from and wanted to see succeed. What does that mean for China? So the way to bet your money is that China will not sustain the order that we have sustained. That is that they will start chipping away at institutions constraining their power. So repudiating the authority of the arbitration court when it, when it votes in favor of the Philippines. They will begin to try and intimidate their neighbors in the way they intimidate their own citizens into accepting a set of rules that the government wants to have. Uh, that they will attempt to peel America's allies away from the common endeavor, right? Because the greatest strength of America since 1945 has been that we play team sports reasonably well. Um, and the Chinese will spoil that if they can because that leaves us weaker and more isolated, which is by itself an enormous victory for the Chinese. So if you think you don't like the American dominated international order and are ready to stop enforcing those rules, be sure you understand what a Chinese dominated order would look like because it won't look like the order that we have experienced in the last uh, 75 years or so. And that's where I will stop and we'll be happy to answer any questions any of you may have.